Gorgeous lad. Delighted to to um, get to meet you at last. And um, great. Likewise. Congratulations with the book. It was quite a challenge, quite a, an undertaking to tackle such a major work of literature. It's a, it's a it's almost a sacred text in parts of Ireland, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I suppose I, I, I've always liked my Ballock Fane as a book, you know, um, it was one of the few books, probably because I had to read it, to be honest with you, years ago, or read bits of it anyway, uh, at some stage, um, it was one of the few books that, yeah, that I always felt in Irish that you, you, you could nearly go back to it, to it, you know, a month later, and you'd nearly find, even though it's a relatively slim book, but that you'd always find kind of new, new things in it, and you'd find, um, yeah, I just like the style of the book as well. You know, um, it's it's just uh, it's kind of a mixture, really, of the oral tradition. I'd say that that he he came out of. I'm I'm guessing, and um, just the way he adapted it, and uh, it, it looks. It looks so easy, you know, yes. you know, nice flow in the book, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and also the fact that he doesn't take himself too seriously, you know, as a lot of writers nowadays probably, you know, um, particularly ones who uh, maybe touch on philosophical questions or at least claim they do, um, you know, they take themselves very seriously altogether. And um, I liked that kind of dark humour, dry wit. Um, and also, actually, just another one that, that kind of attracted to me when, when I went back years later and, and was sort of able to read an Irish language book, you know, and um, um, I, I learned my Irish really after I'd left college, you know, when I, when I was living in England. And I just, I suppose I was kind of embarrassed in a sense that I was living in a very multicultural society at the time in, in Britain, uh, still is, I suppose. And you know, the fact that you'd gone through maybe 20 years of schooling um, down here and just the way Irish was taught and just attitude toward, attitudes towards it, attitudes on our behalf and also the attitudes that came from, you know, the educational system, I suppose, and um, um, that seeped into us as well. You know, you know, that I just felt it was a disaster, really, that uh, we'd spent 20 years in school, you know, a lot of the lads in, in my class were infinitely brighter than I was. And, and yet we didn't have, um, you know, most of us, once we came out at the end of it, we, we still couldn't read a paragraph in Irish. Mm -hmm. Probably 99% of us never would and never would be able to do it anyway. Certainly weren't able to write anything in Irish, you know. Mm -hmm. And I suppose when living in England, then when you're, you're surrounded by all these other cultures, you know, uh, Urdu and... Uh, <laughs> Bengali and, and uh, people from Jamaica and every kind of a place and you're thinking to yourself, you know, um, it's a real, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a treasure of a book and, and it should be available to, to, to people to, uh, in all sorts of other languages to read, you know, and um, yeah. Well, you talk I, about the sort of the attitudes people have to Irish. Yeah. And yeah. we can see that the early stages of that in this book, because he's talking about on Goom, he's talking about the civil service taking over the use of Irish. That's right. And how he, as a native speaker coming from the, the absolute mecca of, of, mm. of the Irish language in Ulster, suddenly finds himself part of this awful system that is, is, is constraining his creativity rather than mm. uh, promoting it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shocking, really, once the state apparatus... <laughs> Kind of gets a stranglehold on something um how what may be very noble ideals and intentions can actually be transformed into something that's the direct opposite of that you know where it puts people off completely we know now for instance not only just in relation to the way the language was taught because there's three different dialects the grammar it, you know i don't care what anyone says like it, it is not a particularly easily language to learn anyway you know in, in my view uh, compared to, you know, people who've learned Chinese from over here or whatever, they, they'd say the same thing to you, you know, that Irish is, is not that, um, grammatically it's, it's quite complex and all the rest, but 
but I, I suppose um, right from the right from the get go, um, I was I was reading a book there by uh, related to 1916 recently, and the person in it was saying um, he fought in 1916, but he was a teacher for a while, and he wanted to be loyal to Irish, and he wanted to be empathetic with it, and he wanted to learn it and everything. Once he was kind of uh, became uh, nationalistically aware and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, he, he already, even at that stage, and that was like kind of 1916, 19, early 1920s, he already felt a kind of um, a negativity towards the language because a lot of teachers were just landed one day and told, you have to teach through Irish now. You have to learn Irish, you know. And, you know, um, <laughs> curriculum change isn't very easy at the best of times, but imagine, you know, um, somebody, and in fact, the same person said, you know, um, I always thought that I spoke Irish. You know what I mean? I, that's, that's how little awareness he had of it because he grew up in Dublin, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, he'd never seen anyone who spoke this other language, etc. cetera. And, and I suppose that carried on really right down to when you think of Joe Heaney, when he first sang channels in, in uh, Dublin, you know, uh, on stage, I think in some show in, in the Abbey or, or Gate or one of them, you know, people started laughing. You know what I mean? Because they didn't, they, they were embarrassed. Like they'd never seen anything like it before. Mm -hmm. And they thought, they didn't even know it was Irish. Do you know yes, what I mean? They yes, yes. Connected with, with, with Ireland even. Mm -hmm. and because they'd never seen it before. And they'd yeah. never heard it before. So, yeah. So, so I, I just, um, um, you can see that straight off because he was obviously a very sensitive person and very artistic. And that, he even mentions at the start, as you say, Seamus, you know, he was translating books, but, uh, and he says, okay, it was as, e as easy as tying your shoelaces, but apparently he was one of the, one of the most prodig prodig prodigious or prolific translators that Ngoom had. He translated an enormous amount, but in a very short space of time. And um, I, I, I think, yeah, he, he pretty much says it straight out in that pretty direct kind of old way at the start, you know, that if he didn't get out of it quickly, um, and out of that system and, you know, whatever the spark of artistic creativity he'd have left would be, um, would be completely eliminated, you know. And, and, I, and I think in a way, Mubalak Fane, okay, it's easy to say it in hindsight because you can judge it from um, what happened to him subsequently in, in that, um, in his life, say. But he says at one stage, um, and he obviously was a person who, he claims he wasn't superstitious, but then... He's, he's always pointing to different signs and people that he meets in the book. And chance has a big part of it as well. A little bit like some of the Jewish writers, like um, Jewish-American Paul Oster, you know, that um, even though he, he claims that those things, that he's beyond all of those things, um, he still lays a lot of store by the people that he meets. You know, and at one stage, he's, he's in a, a spiritualist uh, seance type session in, in Cardiff, I think it is. And, you know, the, the man, the man he's talking to, the first black man he's ever met says, you know, you, you are uh, an artistic person, you are a writer, you're writing certain books, you know, um, some people are, are again, yeah, and some people are for you. Um, and he more or less tells him, you know, the, the book that you have in at the moment isn't the one that will make your name. It's the one after that, the next one sort of thing. And um, and that was that was this my, one, yes, exactly. And I and I, th I think he knew. I think he knew in his heart and soul, yeah, as an instinctive person. You know, um, even though at the end of the book he's saying, you know, I'll um, I'll fight on, you know, and I'm not going to be beaten down by the system by people like O'Connor and people like that, or or, or disillusioned or put off or lack confidence and all the rest of it. Um, and there's an element of the heroic about that. The whole, you know, I'm the man kind of thing, um, but. I, I think also maybe he knew in his heart and soul that, that was his last fling because, you know, um, he, uh, yeah, that, that, that he, he set out to find out, you know, can, can I do this? Can I do this work of art, you know, and just to physically test himself first, you know, and, and mentally, I suppose, as well. Um, and um, he, he mentions that in some of his notebooks, I think that he picked up images along the way, you know, and he's hoping to use them again maybe in his in his novel you know so mm. um yeah yeah but it's an extraordinary portrait as you say it, it, it's a it's a journey uh, obviously the, this road of mine and it's a 
it's a, a, a in one sense he's trying to find himself he's trying to find a way through all these difficulties leaving the the different elements of his past behind but on the other hand it's also a very tragic picture it's a it's, it's a picture of of, of mel- mental illness of uh confusion. i agree I agree. And, and, and in that sense, it's also very valuable because it's a unique uh, description of, of, of this mm. mental illness as it was taking a grip of him, you know? Yeah, and, and, a, and a real one, as opposed to, you know, nowadays, <laughs> I've been cynical now, but you get a lot of faux kind of misery lit, you know, where people are, you know, claiming they had a hard life and sort of, you know, um, transforming that into, you know, what they deem to be art, etc. But he, he was actually just... It's quite obvious that he believed as an artist you had to live out your vocation fully and that if you were if you were to be serious about it you know you couldn't just be um part time or ha- half time night. yeah and translating 12 hours a day and then go home and, and, and write a novel it just wasn't going to happen you know yeah, yeah so so um and also um you're right I, th- I think i don't i don't know enough about um m- maybe the illnesses he suffered from but um to me, there, there are indications there of not, not just maybe manic depression, you know, where he says he felt terrible for months before he even went to Wales um, and he couldn't understand it and he couldn't um, voice it or he couldn't kind of uh, um, articulate it, I suppose. And he didn't understand what it was either, you know. Yeah. And uh, where maybe nowadays that's a good part of modern culture that we, we, we understand a bit more about these things. But the other side of it as well maybe is... Um, yeah, even there's there's images there of saying it relates to the wandering and kind of maybe the wilds of Donegal where he was. Yes, yes. There, there's the business of you know that he doesn't like being cooped up in the city, and it's not a it's not an artificial or a faux imagery you know put on by somebody you know to be I'm the alienated modern man or whatever. It's real. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah. You know, I had to get out of the room because I was starting to feel bad. You know, um, so elements of maybe uh, claustrophobia and um, uh, yeah, a, a, a lot of different uh, factors. Yeah, and, and he he had tried teaching, as he said, he taught in nine schools in nine counties in Ireland, and yeah. he uses the image of the the roll book and the lines going up and down and across, mm-hmm. and he says, "Bar lumps of a car and a kangalcha, I'd prefer to be odd than um, tied up by this whole thing." Yeah, that, in a strange kind of a way, um, that echoes um, whether he would have had. Yeah, read him at that stage or not, I'm not sure. But possibly, um, although some of his books were banned, I suppose, in the beginning, Joyce, but, um, you know, Joyce has that phrase, you know, the nets are thrown out to kind of trap somebody in Ireland, you know, that he had to get out of Ireland as well, you know, yes. and and, um, and permanently, I suppose, Joseph, he looks like the type of person to me who was just such a traditional nationalist, you know, Underneath it all, despite all the barriers and all the begrudgery and all the people maybe hindering him all the way, um, that he's the type of person who'd want to come back home. That would be my impression of him. I never saw the man speaking in my life. Never saw him, uh, but um, Yeah, that, that he's loyal to his own. Exactly, roots, exactly. Like, despite uh, all the things that have happened that have polluted yeah. or upset the ideal, that has spoiled the the vision and part and i think part of that is actually the way that uh to me along with okain maybe as well he's one of the few writers who um you know he, he has a sense that that the people from the goyal are not not in some romantic put um posery kind of way that they're special or whatever but he has a sense that they're they are a different people do you know what i mean they have they have a separate culture that they have um different ways of viewing the world, whether it's viewing religion, whether it's viewing um, um, other people, etc. And also, um, yeah, I think he was quite proud of the Gwethas, you know, and, and kind of, uh, um, despite the fact that, you know, um, uh, there are a lot of hints in the book that maybe other people he came across, particularly in Ireland, weren't, you know what I mean? Yes, <laughs> you know, yes. And kind of thought it was a bit of a jump or whatever, and what are you, what are you doing here? You know, I, I think I read other um, bit, bit, you know, pieces about him in other books that said, you know, uh, which was probably a common experience for people from the Gaelic, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even even much later than Joseph, but that 
you know, they'd even be seen as kind of the boggers in, you know, in the training center, in the training college, et cetera. Yeah. You know, if, um, and, he, and he was put out teaching Irish as well. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you teach Irish because you're from, you're from the Gaelic, where maybe, you know, under a, maybe a more enlightened approach, that person might, might have been, you know, maybe teaching something else as well. You know? yes, yes, yes. He was obviously very well read um, and through his translation work, obviously very well up on um, all sorts of cultural movements and, and trends. You know, there's elements of definitely of absurdism coming in there, you know, Samuel Beckett, you know, kind of uh, the bits about, uh, you know, the, the, the in the room in Liverpool, I think, where the clock is kind of half, half, uh, half broken, etc. And, um, you know, the time is stopped at a certain time. And um, um, yeah, also, also very much this, like, I suppose the thing that maybe saves, you know, you wouldn't say saves it, but the thing that maybe stops it from falling into a kind of a, a very difficult read or whatever, and it's not a difficult read at all. In fact, it's the opposite, is just his nice flowing style of, of writing and also, and probably based on the oral tradition mixed with the more modern sensibility, but also the business of, um, you know, he has a good sense of humor, you know, running through the thing, and that, that's very attractive as well, you know, like, like he can see, even in the darkest moments, he can see the funny thing about, about something, you know, like it's absolutely drenched one night out in Wales somewhere, and then um, he's after climbing through loads of kind of sheep wiring or whatever, and just even a small incident like that, the next morning he, he finds out, and he kind of laughs at it, you know, that he was actually very close to... Um, an area where he could have got shelter, you know what I mean? You know? Yes, yes. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think there's some very, I suppose Vivian Mercier wrote a book years ago, and I remember reading it, or bits of it anyway, years ago about the Irish comic tradition. Tradition, yeah. yeah. And I think the, you know, O'Riordan as well was a, was a similarly. It's been completely ignored and hasn't been focused on, but through maybe a lot of difficulties in his life and sickness and illness and depression and all the rest of it. Um, the, the fun, the, 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 there's a funny, a very strong sense of humour there. And maybe, maybe that goes back to, God knows, it, it might be a generalisation, but a colonial, a colonised people, you know, that you have to find some light in the darkness, you know, and yeah. um, uh, whether it's when they're out in the boat, you know, I mean, they nearly got, they nearly died, basically. Yes, yes, but, yes. Uh, um, he manages to find, you know, uh, a funny thing in it. You know, even when he's coming back in, um, I noticed he said, you know, there were a bunch of women, you know, swimming. Uh, that's the good thing about the book is, and it's a sign of a good book. Every time you go back to it, you can you can find something new. You know, yeah. he yeah. says there were, uh, it looks like a Victorian um, swimming club, um, you know, kind of out swimming there near... Uh, near near Hoth, I think it was, as they were coming back in. But he kind of he kind of says, I wonder did they notice us as we came back in? You know, as in, you know, or maybe they didn't. In other words, you know, I'm kind of the hero, the the holy fool kind of thing, you know, coming coming back in, did some crazy things. Um but um and I think he got that from the oral tradition was that that emphasis on, on the, the hero, you know, um you still see it in some of the um um, funnily enough, I, I did a lot of kind of work with elderly travellers, you know, for years. You know what I mean? And a lot of a lot of their folk tales, the last ones, the last people amongst them who could tell stories in the uh, you know um, up to about the seventies or eighties when they were all settled down, sort of thing. Um, you know, by the state, the the old people overwhelmingly ninety nine percent of the stories were heroic figures, you know what I mean, where the hero gets the better against big odds, you know what I mean, that, that he, he pulls through in the end, or she, you know, or gets the better of somebody else, and um, I, I, th I think the way he's, in modern culture, the way you see it a lot is, you see it in boxing, I suppose it's still there, but, but you also see it in, um, I think, in rap music, among, amongst the black community in America, you know, where they're, they kind of... Um, it probably goes back to a very old thing, back to the Philly, you know, the Philly kind of um, competing against one another, you know, and basically it's, it's, it's kind of, I'm the man, I'm the man who can, can uh, um, I'm the main man. Yeah, you know and McGreen certainly has that element of it, yeah. and he sees himself as someone who has descended 
from the ports. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. um, when he's signing his name in the, the guest house, he signs his name as Cahalbui Magillagona. And That's right. Yeah. Know, he, he's, <laughs> he's taking on the, the mantle of a, of a very famous mm -hmm. uh, Ulster mm -hmm. port. And of course, the joke is as well, the landlady hasn't a clue. She doesn't recognise anything odd about this name at all. The people in <laughs> Dublin, they've never heard of Carl Boy McGillagall. Yeah. He's one yeah. of the heroes. Uh, he was a rake. He was a character as well as a, a poet. Mm. And mm. it's it's understandable that, that McGreena would maybe uh, model himself or like to identify mm. with, with, mm. with somebody like Carl Boy. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, because, because in a way he, he was... Apart from O'Connor and, and Raftery, I suppose, he was the last person who was sort of in that category, you know, um, a direct descendant, if you want to put it, of the, of the wandering uh, Philly Tashtel, you know. Yeah. And um, also, also just uh, that whole thing of boasting at the start, you know. It, it's at the start and it's at the end. You know, at the start of the book, it's, um, I'll, uh, I'm going to find the truth. This is my quest, you know. Nothing will stop me from finding it, even if I don't like what I find. Um, and he's kind of sure, I'm, I'm the best poet there is like, do you know yes, what I mean? Yes. And I kind of more or less, I might be ignored, but like that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that uh, I don't know I am, you yes, know? Yes, then yes. The, end, the very last page of the book, it's like, I'm still the man, you know, I've got through all of this. Um, you know, I've got all these, these fantastic artistic images and ideas from my journey through Wales, etc. And I'm still the kind of, it's, it's kind of a melding really of the old heroic tradition, I think, with, with the modern idea of the alienated man. So mm -hmm. the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. In, a way, in a way, I think Macarena, well, maybe he will in the future, but he hasn't really got to, he hasn't, well, there's very little critical work done on him yet, mm -hmm. but he hasn't, um, he hasn't got enough praise, I think, for the way he managed to kind of join the medieval tradition yeah. with with the more modern one, I feel. and um, Yeah, and we have to remember that it was a huge leap for people who were coming from a completely oral absolutely. tradition to suddenly uh, land in the middle of 20th century uh, yeah. published yeah. literature. So the leap that he made is extraordinary. It is, because even, even at a later date, uh, you have a writer like Jeremy Dogrania, say he wrote a book called On Tramp, and it was you know, based on his kind of uh, working on building sites and that in England. And um, he even describes it, say, in the, in the late 60s, early 70s in Britain, he was in Birmingham and a few other cities that uh, he came across a lot, of, a lot of people who'd come from rural areas in Ireland, not necessarily from the West Coast even, you know, from Jamaica, from other former colonies, and that they were... He, he nearly says they were suffering from a form of psychosis, really, because the leap is too big, like between you're coming out of this. It's, it's, a, it's a shock. It's a shock mentally and physically and psychologically to your system um, to suddenly be um, urbanized like that so, so, so quickly. And um, uh, yeah, that's, de that's definitely there in his... And, uh, Another thing that, that's there as well, and I, I'm for sure I, I, my gut feeling would be that he, and again, maybe the critics need to do more research on him. Um, there's that idea of the holy fool, in, 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 uh, particularly in, in Jewish culture, in Russian literature, in um, um, Eastern Europe, and in particular, it lasted much longer over there. But uh, but also it was there in, in, in England as well. I mean, if you go back to, you know, Shakespeare, even Henry IV, you know, the clown or the fool is often the person who's has better insights than the person who's, uh, you know... Um, top dog. Top dog. Yeah, exactly. It's the underdog. It's the underdog, the person who's... Uh, and that what I think is very interesting about Magrina as well is because it's part of, a little bit part of his image, I suppose, as... I'm wandering through this landscape of the imagination, really. Um, okay, in the, in the form of a physical journey, and I'm testing my body and, and my, my soul, etc. And, you know, how committed I am, really, to this artistic project. That's what he's really testing, I suppose, and whether I'm able to do it or not. But the other thing as well is, is um, he... Uh, sorry, it's gone out of my mind now, but... Um, yeah, that, 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 I, that idea of the... Uh, 
Um, it'll come back to me in a minute now. Sorry. Okay, you're, no, you're okay. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, uh, it's it's just slipped my mind now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but but yeah, that that idea, I suppose, of a quest kind of thing. His Holy Grail really is is kind of the Holy Grail of the imagination. In a, in a way, he's been bogged down maybe by years of drudge work, and it's kind of um, not only a sense of freedom, just just kind of walking the road, etc. And that's another thing as well, actually, which, which is interesting about the journey is, and which probably um, he, he obviously could tell in, in in his body that I need to be doing something. Do you know what I mean? I need to yeah. be action. I need to do, do a long Physical, walk. Yeah. To, uh, and he, he, before he even goes to Wales, he does go for long walks, he mentions, by the sea, and he feels a bit better. But that's not so different from nowadays where you have a lot of people maybe who suffer from anxiety or from different things. And, you know, maybe they, they're they quite into sports. Eh? Do you know what I mean? You know, or running or walking or, or whatever it is. You know, everybody has their own way, I suppose. Of, mm-hmm. Um. But sorry, yeah, no, what, what, I was, what I was thinking of there was, say, he says at the start, you know, and it's part of his image as, you know, I'm the man kind of thing, I think, that, um, you know, I don't care about anyone else, you know, I, I, I'm the man, I'm tough, you know, I, I, can, I can manage, I can survive, and there's an element probably of trying to convince himself as well through it, even when he, when he meets uh, Macha Mangrua, you know, um, the girl, the girl in, in Liverpool, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, yeah, she's really into me, you know, but I can kind of take it or leave it, you know, like sort of thing, you know, um, 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 I'm not too bothered, you know, sort of thing. But at the same time, and, and at the start of the book, he says, I'm not interested, he says, I don't care about other people. I'm not interested in other people. And that, to be honest with you, in a sense, that's, it's, it's a denigration of the new free state in a way, which is that it has become really mercantile and it has become real, really, really, um, and it's just continued ever since, I suppose. Yeah. But so I think he's, he wants to, sort of, he eventually sort of spiritually finds his way back to, to Ranafarsh, to, to, to Donegal. That's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. where the home is, the heart is. And mm. that's, that's, mm. the, that's the, the tubber, that's the well from which he's going to, to keep on drawing as long, as long as he can. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's like a circular kind of a, a journey. But, but the other, the other thing is the, um, well, yeah, like like he says at the be- at the beginning, I don't care about other people. I'm not interested in them. But in actual fact, I think he's very interested in other people because everybody he meets along the way, um, he gets an energy from them, or he, you know, um, and that's where his very lyrical, poetic style comes in. To many of the places that you would want to go to in Donegal, and so you you had to go the Valahain. You, you you took your own uh, co- course through the hills uh, to the coast to to Ranafarshia, and Magrena was the great inspiration. We'd all read the book. We all thought this was brilliant. That he was a man who thought for himself, who did things in his own ways. And then, of course, on the other hand, there was this mystery about him. We knew he was still alive, but we knew that he disappeared from the scene as far back as 1935, that he'd, he'd made a very definite statement that, you know, the well has run dry. I've done my best. I cannot do, I, I, I cannot do any more. And I don't care, you know. So it was an extraordinary sense of attitude in, and and your translation really brings that across. I think it it shows the magic and the mystery, uh, and the sort of the, the pulling power of, of McGrena and his work. Mm. Did, did um, you know when he said it is come along, Seamus? When when you met him, do you think do you think do you think he meant that, or do you think that that was a kind of a was that just his way of sort of. I, I think realizing that he, he was in bad health and, and all that, you know. It probably is, but I suppose most of us reading it would like to think there was a sort of a, a defiance there that he was, yeah. he, 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 you know, he, he was his own man. He was going to do his own thing. And, you know, it's comma, I don't yeah. care, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it was important to meet him, to make the, 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 the physical contact, if you like, because in... Um, this road of mine, he talks about the connection between 
Padraig O'Connor, uh, you know, the house he was in, that this was the house that Padraig O'Connor had been in. And in one of his other books, he mentions he actually met Padraig O'Connor on the train. And so there's a mm. living link there. So for me, as, a, as an aspiring writer, the, mm. the, 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 fascin the, the aim was to make that link. So I, I, I went into the hospital in, Let in, in Letterkenny with my rucksack on my back, literally off the road, having tramped um, through the, you know, probably from several miles outside uh, Letterkenny to get there and asked to see him and he came and, and we sat at a table and, and had a chat. We had previously exchanged a few letters. So I felt it, it was a way of sort of um, paying my dues, uh, homage to the, to the master, you know, it was, it was <laughs> seeking out your guru, if you like, you know, but uh, I, I'm really glad I did it and uh, yeah. to, to have made that connection, you know. And do you, th do you think he probably appreciated it that, that he, you know... Um, oh, yes, I mean... He, he kind of ignored he, and forgotten, really, wasn't he, for a long time, so... He, he was, and that's yeah. that's the way uh, the wheels of the world move move very slowly. And it, it's lucky that his, um, you know, that he did get the recognition in the end. I mean, there was the, even the, you know, the, the TV documentary was made about six months before he died. And, oh, yeah. and even when I, I understand that even in his last couple of weeks when he was in hospital, uh, the man in the next bed to him was, was Paddy Tunney, the, the, the singer, the, and uh, who also right. was a writer and who was a fluent yeah. Irish speaker. So Paddy was telling me afterwards, you know, that how, yeah. uh, how it sort of, the two of them got strength from each other being there together uh, in mm. the hospital at the time, you know? Mm. Mm. And what, what did you, um, I suppose, uh, <laughs> direct like Magrina was as well I mean what did you what um, did you talk about when it, you met him it's yeah. I'm not saying we, we we talked about anything very profound because after all yeah. this, was, this was an old man we'd never met before he did mm. recognize that I that I you know, my name when I said look I'm I, I wrote to you recently looking for advice and I, I thanked him for the advice he'd given me and we just chatted generally about 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 things you know um mm. and also to be honest i had never been in a, a mental hospital i never or like an old people's home or anywhere like yeah. that so i had no idea how to talk to somebody or what you know somebody who's been cut off from from life for for so many years in one sense um mm. what exactly do you talk about so it was mostly pleasantries yeah. and generalizations but I, I'm I'm really glad I did it, and hopefully it, mm. it it broke up his day a bit for this strange hippie character to come in off the street, <laughs> you know. And, Very good, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I think it, even though it's probably um, it's probably overdone now, maybe to an extent. You know, there's so much talk about therapy and about you know people yeah. finding. Mm -hmm. In her amazingness or whatever, yes. but uh, I like it in a way. I suppose two two things that that he was he was always talking about the magic in the world. I suppose and that there's a magic behind the the screen of of words if you mm -hmm. can find it, kind of thing. Yes, yes. Um, that there's another world, a real world, maybe there. Uh, but but um, in in a strange kind of a way, I mean. I suppose in hindsight you can you can always find connections, but in a strange kind of a way, it is really strange that right now Brexit is going on. Right now there's this kind of COVID issue, which we, which we're all looking at. Sort of, uh, you know, how, how does that bear on on our relationships with each other, kind of thing, uh, and 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 even the business as well. Of, of in recent years, there has been a lot more focus, hasn't there, on kind of. In Ireland, prob probably there was wasn't any focus on it at all. Maybe at one stage, really, because it was um, our attitudes were tor towards mental illness, etc., were kind of Victorianism, Victorian. It, that we, it wasn't talked about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the British, and and there was a taboo about it, a stigma, like you get maybe in in poorer countries today as well. But um, but the other thing is is um, uh, like. I'm no, I'm no psychologist or psychiatrist or anything, but th I think just on my kind of layman's gut instinct or whatever, I, th I think there are things in the, the book that point to, he was, he was trying to talk about that, 
Oh yes, I would agree. Archie definitely. Gunners. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And and that's yeah. so it's it it is literally his inner journey as well as his physical mm. journey. And mm. it's mm. almost an invitation to come and to come and walk the road with him, you know. Um yeah. Yeah. And, and when you're talking about COVID and the way we're all locked in at the minute, it's definitely a sort of a a book like that would inspire you to think, well, look, when the springtime comes, when we're let loose again. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. let's take to the road. Let's take to the hills and 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 uh, you know and and, <laughs> yeah. and, and re, re, rediscover ourselves and rediscover Ireland, rediscover Donegal. Go go back go back to the source. You know. Yeah. So yeah. it is very inspiring. I mean, that's the beauty of it. While it's a, a in one sense, it's a it's a tragic book. It's a sad book, but nevertheless, there's so much positivity and um, it, mm. it it really uplifts you as well. You know, and and I think it, it's a wonderful thing. Now that it has been made available for people, because it will it will give the book a new lease of life. Hopefully, a new, yeah. A new yeah. generation of people will discover it. It will. Mm. People will start asking questions. They'll want the discussions will begin, and mm. uh, it mm. it will be very interesting to see what what comes of it. Yeah, like it's already thank God, thankfully, um, um, it's already been translated into Welsh. Um, uh, you know, uh, by Anna Harrod Thomas. She's a children's writer over there um well an adult writer as well but uh and and language activist but but um so hopefully now it'll, it'll, it'll come out in welsh you know uh, in, in a few months time but but um yeah i, I it, it's funny like because ireland has changed so much i think maybe in the last few decades you know people say we changed more in in one day in 10 years than germany or france or other even Britain say changed in 40 years yeah. <laughs> um, just the social changes have been so quick and and just I think the change is even in terms of, of people's own um, material lives you know um, um, I'm 51 now and 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 you're a bit younger than me Seamus but like we, we're <laughs> no, and was I, so poor like yeah. it, even it's even difficult to explain to yeah, you know, exactly. The one, when we I wanna, about, I'm, yeah, yeah, I want to do one of like 11 kids and say, if I talk to my, my young, you won't mind me saying this now, but if I talk to my, say, youngest brothers, you know, uh, and sisters, you're, you're talking about a different time. Yeah, it's a different generation. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Different generation. That has happened. We, we can do this on the internet when a lot of us didn't have a phone when, when we were absolutely, growing up. You absolutely. Know? So, I mean, the, the thing yeah. has come on leaps and bounds it's, it's really mm, mm, mm. it really is but but in a way in a way then with macarena you had you know when, he, when he's writing about uh, when he's um <laughs> when they're doing the letters where, they, where they're sending out um ellie oh, ben ellie yeah. oh you know, yes the, yes yes the teller. fortune teller yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's kind of like a group email but he yes. but he says obviously they had to write them all out by hand but yes it, yes it's, um you know at that time i suppose it was kind of a novel thing in a way he's kind of saying oh well the way we got around the situation was we kind of sent out a general letter to everybody kind of thing uh, our general terms in them but um so then, then you're going back another generation again kind of thing and i suppose when he was born and he lived to such a good age then as well yes, when he was yes, yes. people remember the family even you know at that time yeah. and, and, and well that's what he was like, born like in, in, in a way in, I, in 1900 or 1901 when he was born when we think of how remote um, Donegal was from Dublin or Belfast, um, even from Letterkenny or from from, from Ballyshannon. When you're thinking of where they were, right on the coast, in a most extraordinary little little place that's still a very important place. I mean, it's funny. I remember again when I was a student one year, we were all heading off on a bus and we were stopped by the army on the border and they said, "Where are, where are you going?" And we said, "We're going to Ranafast or Ranafast." And the soldier got out his map. It wasn't on the map, you know. <laughs> and we we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't even point it out. We didn't know exactly where where we was. Look, it's somewhere there, but it it's just one of these sort of. It was almost a magical, a, a mystical sort of place, and it's still, mm. I suppose, especially mm. for for Irish speakers in the north, it still has yeah. an aura or something. It has a draw, and Mavalahain is one of the one of the doors into it. You know. Mm. Mm. Um, and 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 I suppose the other thing about the book is, it's very international, you know, in, in the sense of uh, the philosophical questions he raises and the wry humour and all that. Yes, um, yes. 
it's 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 it, it can it can transfer in, into a lot of other cultures i think and um and also just the fact that actually most a lot, a lot of the book is set abroad that's you know, true which is, it, it, which is was a big step forward yeah. for for when you think of his brother Seamus Ugrina, all his work is set right in on the very shore of uh, of Radefast, on the very on the coast there whereas mm. Joseph was he was stepping out he was he was breaking down barriers his mm. outlook was completely different mm. you know he was the, the Gaeltacht was the source was the base it was the launch pad if you like and he was he was mm. going to take on the world yeah he wasn't going back he wasn't going kind of uh no, regressing. He wasn't time. regressing. Yeah, yeah. He was. It wasn't yeah, yeah. mentality. Certainly, he was um, fully aware of the tradition, and he drew from the tradition. He talks about all the old poets that he knew, and the singers, and the songs, and even you know the different families he was descended from. But that was his foundation, and it was mm. from there he was building something new upon that. So it's not a sort of a book for people who want to go back and, you know, discover how people lived on the Blasket Islands 150 years ago. It's not that mm. sort of nostalgic Gaeltacht trip by any means. Mm. It's a very much, mm. as you say, it's a philosophical, mm. it's a personal, mm. it's a 20th century novel, very much so. Mm. Mm. And, um, yeah, all, all the more remarkable, really, um, for when he wrote it, to be honest. I mean, just, OK, may, maybe he had access to... You yeah, know. I, mean, I think he could read French, and he would. You know, I'm sure, even though could he, he could he, yeah, yes, yeah. even though he criticizes the the the, the people in Angoum, you can be sure that there was great conversation going on between these different uh, people, and they were all translating these books. They must have been talking about literature all the time, you know, yeah, as well as points yeah. of grammar and looking for the right word for uh, for concepts that were were totally foreign to 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 Rana Farsh. Um mm. So. Mm. I, and of course, the irony is he criticizes the goom left, right, and center, but they did publish the book, you know. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Um, I mean, he, he liked to have his, his his growl, but at the end of the day, you know, it it, it wasn't all bad. Yeah, yeah. And you know, um, Seamus, did you ever um, did you ever touch on the question of? Uh, you know, did you ever? No, I never discussed that with him at all. No. Yeah, um, yeah. And I mean, there again, there were various stories and again, the, the part of the mystique of McGrain is there were so many unanswered questions, there were so many theories, there were so many rumours and uh, because nobody actually went and did the academic thing or the, went back to the source, uh, a lot. It, it's only now with work like yourself and Anton McLaughlin, uh, Anton McGarr and different people like that, that are actually beginning to 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 peel off the layers and we're beginning to to see that McGrain is working a whole new new light and I think it's wonderful. Was it was there talk of an English book, an English language book that he wrote that that has disappeared or has or, been mislaid, the the miracle yeah. of Cashel Moore. That that's that's okay. true, yeah. And so did anyone read it? Did anyone read it, Seamus, or did anyone see it? I mean uh, I believe wasn't... I believe it has been seen, but I have never seen it. I don't I don't know anything about it at all, you know. Um, the um, and I wonder what's what what would the <laughs> well it's always a complex relationship when you have somebody who's a writer or an artist and maybe their writing obviously is very influenced by their local area but mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. um, well again I suppose what the locals thought of them you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, it, it's one of these it's one of these very complex questions. I mean, on Drum and War is the other novel which Art Hughes has translated, which was you know set again very topical for for where we are now, the decade of of centenaries, and that on Drum and War was was about the local marching band and how whoever whichever faction within the village controlled the band sort of controlled the the soul of of the of the place, and so it had been sort of a, a Hibernian band, and then Sinn Fein got onto it, so. And, and as I say, that's what the novel is about. And it was because of the local sensitivities that that book wasn't published for many years, you know. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, as you say, life has moved on so much. Generations have passed since then. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble is maybe a lot of the people who had the answers, they've passed on as well. But uh, you never know. Yeah. Sure there's still more to be found uh, out about it, you know. Absolutely. And, um, and I suppose the other thing as well is he wasn't, the only writer who, whose books didn't, you know, there were other writers and for very legitimate reasons as well. I mean, 
Um, as you say, someone can have their growl and have their. Um, so, sometimes that can that can be a, a drive a drive for somebody as well, you know, to kind yeah. of go well, Fecky anyway. Yeah. Like um, you're not going <laughs> to stop me, kind of thing. And and there is that going on in in Mavalak Fane anyway. But but um. Yeah, like there were other writers as well. I suppose there was a guy, Seamus O'Moyne Caha, down in um, between Tipperary and Watford there. And like his books weren't weren't published for until like a year or two, or one of his books anyway, uh, but wasn't published until a year or two before he died. And the reason was, you know, people probably were identifiable, you know, within yeah, yeah, yeah. and um it wouldn't take a genius to work out who, who's who. who. <laughs> And then nah. the funny thing is, people's attitude to privacy has changed. In the old days, the worst thing that could happen to you would be for your name to be in the local paper because you were drunk driving or something. Nowadays, people plaster things on, on, on Facebook. You know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a complete reverse, you know. Yeah. There, there's yeah. no shame. There's no, whereas I think no. back then it was, you know, mm. keep the head down. Don't, don't, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, don't let um, don't let us down. But nowadays, people the the, the more blase, they, they they don't care, you know. And the other thing as well was, I mean, at the end of the day, I think I think he was, uh, you know, a traditional nationalist, you know, who who believed that, uh, um, who believed in that ideal, you know, mm -hmm. maybe ideals, yeah. you know, were <laughs> didn't come to fruition for, for mm -hmm. them to a lot of people, but but um, and that's a disappointment, but. But the other side of it is, um, yeah, I, I, th I think among, you're dead right, James. I think amongst that generation, there was a pride sometimes in not revealing things, yes. you know, because it was kind of like, um, I'll never forget it. When I was in national school, Fado, Fado, you know, one of our teachers, she was from Clare, um, brilliant teacher altogether. Uh, she and you know a nationalist and she loved the irish language and and um she kind of imbued a, a love for it amongst us in national school which you know maybe wasn't there when we went to secondary school later on but, but um uh yeah i'll never forget she was she was fairly young in the job at the time and i've met her since and then talked to her about this and and you know she she had um she asked us all to go home and if we had extended family living with us, et cetera. And funnily enough, we actually did. You know, we, um, my gra my grandparents on one side and my granddad were living with us, um, kind of in an extension on the back of the house kind of thing. And, um, you know, and, and it was in a rural area outside Galway City, you know, very rural at the time. So you would have had um, a lot of people who the extended family might have been just down the road. So they not necessarily been in the same house, but they would have been very close. So... Um, but I'll never forget it. She, she asked us to go home and ask people about, say, I think the Black and Tans, about the Civil War, about, you know, did any of them remember anything that had been said to them by their own parents about the famine, etc. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget it. The following day, we all came into school and, you know, not one person had any information right. about it. Mm -hmm. and, and I, well, it's certainly in my case, what it was, was, you know, um, the, the grandparents said, well, listen, that's, that was a sad time. Uh, life was very difficult at the time. You know, we don't, it was nearly like, we don't really want to burden you. with. Yeah, with, or, or we don't want to open up old wounds again, maybe. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. I, and I'm sure there was a lot of that about the Civil War as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which remained unspoken as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember um, my granny on the other side, she, um, she was maybe early 90s when she died. She lived to a very good age and she, <laughs> I only discovered when she was quite old that say she had been um, you know that both 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 her and say the man she married their families had come from different sides yeah. which I've happened in a lot of cases mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I imagine the way I'm, not, I'm only guessing now because I never went into detail with her about it but um, because it you know it was too late really by the time it was mature yeah. to talk about those things and interested in them anyway but, but uh, she I'd imagine for a lot of those people, the way they, they dealt with those issues was actually silence. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. just to talk about it. It was yeah. easier not to talk about it because mm -hmm. you just would raise old bitternesses and wounds and, um, and, and sadnesses in their own life as well about yeah. what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think nowadays, as you were saying there with social media and the media being all pervasive and all powerful in a way, they've kind of nearly replaced um, maybe the church in Ireland at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, 
for for kind of um, how we project images of the past and then the present and all the rest of it. But but they um, you you get the sense a lot of the time, uh, you know. I don't know. I find I find that a lot of the time you you read articles and you realize you know this person with the best will in the world has no concept of what life was like for the people at that time. Do you know yes, what I mean? Yes, you know? yes, yeah. Uh, sometimes it can be quite critical about, you know, people in the past who didn't, um, God knows, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that's... In their that's, local area were, were put in, a, put in a, an institution or something like yes, that. Yes, yes, So and that's like, the beauty of a book like this. It brings us back into the mindset of mm -hmm. the people of that time and mm -hmm. what they were struggling to come to terms with and certainly mm -hmm. McGrena had a you know he, he says he spent so many he, that he fought for a cause that he didn't really believe in or doesn't believe in anymore mm -hmm. and he you know mm -hmm. he realizes that Dublin is still Dublin the civil service is still the same civil service that was there before the revolution uh, that mm -hmm. in some sense mm -hmm. nothing has changed and that's mm -hmm. so that there's a bitterness or a disappointment there and he has to sort of realign himself, and, and that's part of the, the process. So he's remaining loyal and true to where he has come from, and he's trying to find his way in, mm. in, in, through, mm. these, in, in through these new realities. So, I mean, I think for, for historians, for um, people interested in social history, yes, mm. go back to this road of mine and, and, and follow it for a while, and, and mm. they'll certainly get something out of it, more than they'll get from statistics or anything like that, you know. Yeah, um, you just reminded me there. At one point, he says about um, you know when he was when he was in Angoon that we were like when you're talking about kind of silence and observing what's going on, which a writer does, I suppose, or, or, or an artist. Um, he said he says he has a few lines where he says, you know, I was I was watching all around me to see you know what was going on and trying to learn, trying to learn about the system, trying to learn about. Um, how things worked really you know and and i suppose to survive in ireland at the time that's you, you had to do that yeah you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you had to um particularly particularly if you were and it's not even going back to that time you know maybe in, in my generation as well kind of kind of um you know depending on on your background um you may have say more people got education say etc in, in my time but even less than in in, in magrina's time yes yeah so, um but then in, in a way you, you're the first person who's trying to navigate uh, yes you're yes you're plowing it your own furrow you're doing something yeah. new uh yeah. but, but obviously yeah. in the civil service you're going to be constricted there are rules and regulations mm. you have there's a conformity there that a different mm. sort of set of rules than he would have had in, in rana Farsh. there certainly would have been plenty of social rules where he came from but these ones were were something completely different so listen absolutely Michael, um mm. Kogarjas, congratulations <laughs> on the book i think it's it's great Remagas. i hope that lots of people um seek it out and read it and and discover a whole you know the hidden ireland we you hear this phrase very often the hidden yeah, ireland. well yeah. this is a particular part of ireland this is donegal this is a part of ireland that's particularly hidden up to now mm. and i think you've mm. duskal to and doris you've you've opened a door and i hope enough other day. people <laughs> will will walk through this door and follow this road of mine <laughs>